Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the third uh, event in the online portion of the Sovereign Intimacies exhibition. I'm Jennifer Smith, one of the co-curators of Sovereign Intimacies, an exhibition put on in partnership between Gallery 1CO3, Plugin ICA, and with support of Video Pool Media Art Centre. I am the guest curator for Gallery 1CO3 and have had the absolute honour and privilege of co-curating this exhibition with Nazrin Himada, the curator at Plugin ICA. We are here on Treaty 1 territory, the territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and homeland of the Métis Nation. For me, this land acknowledgement is about acknowledging my Métis ancestors who have always inhabited the lands in and around Winnipeg. Uh, today, I think it's especially important to acknowledge this as it's the 135th anniversary of Louis Riel's uh, execution by the Canadian state. Sovereign Intimacies is an exhibition that grew from the relationships that Nazrin and I have been building. Our care for each other was woven into this exhibition and our care for the exhibition is reflected, um, it, sorry, is reflected in our care for each other and our community. We talked about artists working in similar ways to us, artists who learn from each other, who value each other, and these artists are leading and complicating discussions about diaspora, culture, decolonization, and all while finding a place for joy, love, and respect of each other and the lands that they live and work on. This exhibition is meant to be a continuing conversation with the work in, in the gallery space um, and a large component of online programming to contribute to this conversation. Currently, the exhibition space is closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we are very happy to still be able to gather here tonight with Iris Yuri Hu. And I would uh, also like to acknowledge the other artists uh, in the exhibition, uh, Hassan Ashraf, Annie Beach, Ayumi Gatto, Melanie Mon Monoceros, Peter Morin, Mariana Munoz Gomez, Wanda Nanabush, M. Norbese Phillip, Megan O'Brien, Marianne Redhead, Cheyenne Thomas, and David Thomas. Before I hand um, this over to Nazrin to um, introduce us to Iris this evening, um, I would also just like to thank Jennifer Gibson from Gallery 1CO3 who helps helped organize this event and has been an integral part of organizing the exhibition. Thank you to Evan from the University of Winnipeg who is helping out with the live stream and to all of the team at Plugin ICA for all of the hard work that they have contributed to this program. So Nazrin, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Jen. Um, I thank you. I'm honored and so privileged to have worked with you on this exhibition. I feel so lucky. Um, I feel so lucky that we're here tonight too with Iris. And yeah, I wanna thank Jennifer Gibson as well. Uh, for helping coordinate this, and Evan, who's behind the scenes. Um, I am Nazrin Hamada. I'm the curator at Plugin ICA, as Jen mentioned. Um, and I'd like to just take a few moments to give context and background uh, to how I got here, how my family was able to make a life on these lands and territories and waters. And I'm here because my family was forced off of their own lands and couldn't make a life from where they come, from where my ancestors come. I am from Palestine from a place called Tarshiha. My grandparents were the last of my family's generation to have lived on their lands in Tarshiha. They had to escape in 1948 because of the occupation and ran by foot across the border into Southern Lebanon and became refugees in Beirut. Through the colonial systems that enforce migration and that enable further colonial conquest by way of immigration in so-called Canada, my parents were given citizenship and have lived in many different parts of this land since 1989. I've mostly made my life in Jojiage in so-called Montreal for 15 years, the longest time, the longest place I've lived in. Uh, so I call it my home and then had the honor and absolute privilege to move here, to now live here, to work here and to meet incredible people like Jen here on Treaty One territory, the territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. It is my absolute pleasure tonight, and I'm thrilled to introduce Iris Yuri Hu, who is one of the exhibition artists in Sovereign Intimacies, as Jen mentioned, and who's here tonight to talk, us, to talk with us about the incredible installation featured in the exhibition. 
She's also here to talk about her general practice, which really does connect to how we make relations with the people around us and the lens that we are on, and how these intimacies manifest in our life and practice. Iris's work for me is a good example of how there's no distinction between how one lives and between how one practices or cultivates a practice. That art and life combine in an ethics formed by care, by listening, and by being present. Iris centers a deep commitment to cultivating, to cultivating relationships and intimacy with the histories of people and places in which she encounters, conditioning an ethical framework that connects these histories to the earth, creating a space for how sustainability and awareness are part and parcel of these relations. Iris creates a line of connection between all the elements that come to form our knowledge of place and of being. And she uses art as a vehicle to give form to these stories, subjects, and movements that exist in the entanglement of colonization and dispossession of land and peoples. Iris is an artist who works in painting, fibers. She is also a writer. In her work, what, in, in her work one may encounter materials, stories, living organisms, and ecologies from Taiwan, California, Southern China, Mexico, and the American Southwest. She's interested in how people, places, and things are interconnected and networked and how collaboration in the form of learning from, working with, and being in relation to can enable transformative futures and friendships. Her work has led her to form connections with historians, artists, scientists, keepers of traditions, and community organizers, and she centers learning and collaboration as methods of engagement. Her work is both research-based and dependent on lived experience. And she has shown in many different places, such as the Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, or LACE, OxyArts at Occidental College, John Michael Kohler Arts Center, Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery, Women's Center for, the, for Creative Work, Human Resources in Los Angeles, Lenfest Center for the Arts in New York, and Visitor Welcome Center, also in Los Angeles. Iris has also been commissioned for mural wraps at California State University, Dominguez Hills, and for bus and rail posters for the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transpor Transportation Authority. She has held residencies at the Women's Center for Creative Work, and most recently at Carrizozo Air, and is currently in residence at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator where she'll develop creative projects to reorient ourselves in the immediacy of the changing environment. She's working on her first book, which I'm so excited to hear about, hopefully tonight, and is currently teaching fine arts at Otis College of Art and Design. Welcome, Iris. Thank you so much, Nasrin and Jennifer. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for your introductions as well. Um, very moving to hear in which, or how, you sort of map one's history throughout time and lands. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the, I think what we wanted to do tonight is keep it cool and casual. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Iris, you wanted us to just maybe jump right into a conversation. Yeah, um, I'm also prepared to share um, some work, uh, maybe three bodies, three bodies of work. Um, but we can begin talking. Um, however, however you want to do it. Okay, awesome. I don't well, know Jen, if you have questions to begin. Um, yeah, well, I did have a few questions that I've just been thinking about throughout the, the process of um, spending so much time with your work um, and, and learning about you. And I, and I think, um, I, and so currently both Nazrin and I are um, mentors for a program here in Winnipeg with a few, a few artists and some of them are actually part of the exhibition as well. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about your experiences with mentorship. And so, um, you know, both learning, weaving um, from people, uh, you know, similar methods of, or not methods, but a similar product that you finish at the end, but um, very different methods of creating, different um, cultural significance um, and, and 
how that's affected your practice and how you how you incorporate weaving into your practice. Yeah, um, I think uh, teaching and learning for me are sort of one and the same, and it's a way. Um, it's a framework for me to sort of move within and about. Um, I often seek uh, these kinds of relationships in which um, uh, what, like I can learn something or um, reorient myself sort of differently. Um, and a lot of it has to do or motivated by this, like wanting to return to the earth. Um, and that that is as poetic, as literal, as grand, as as minute, as as small as that means. Um, and actually, I think that may be like a good segue into this one body of work um, that uh, I worked on with uh, Julia Bogni, who is a Tongva elder. Um, here and uh, the Tongva are uh, the ancestral caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin, um, which is where I'm joining you from. Um, and she, her great grandmother um, passed through what's called the San Gabriel Mission. Um, and if you don't know, uh, sort of California has, um, was part of Spain. Um, and uh, part of that meant that there was this mission, Catholic mission system that was um, erected throughout the state from south to north. Um, and San Gabriel was the site of the fourth Spanish mission, I think, erected in 1776. Um, and it was a place of um, Catholicism, but it was also a place of enslavement. Um, a lot of uh, Tongva people were forced to labor at the missions, um, as well as uh, Tataviam folk who, uh, whose lands are uh, to the north in San Fernando Valley, uh, what's typically known as the Valley um, in LA, uh, as well as the Chumash, um, as well as other indigenous groups that were sort of brought from south um, and migrating upwards north. Um, and I grew up near this mission, uh, like 10 minutes away. And so part of my wanting to understand, and this place now, San Gabriel, uh, is a huge immigrant hub. A um, lot of Asian immigrants, a um, lot of South and Central American immigrants, um, also second generation um, children of, of those who immigrated. Um, and how it became this sort of immigrant hub was because after World War II, um, there were looser racial restrictions on who could uh, rent and buy known property. Um, and so San Gabriel was one of these places. Um, and so therefore my grandfather or my grandparents were able to purchase a home um, about 10 minutes away from this mission. I realize that I'm looking at the mission and no one else is looking at the mission. Um, so let me just share my screen. Um, so this is what this mission uh, looks like. And I'll also put closed captions on. So, right, so this is the San Gabriel mission. Over the summer, it just kind of suffered a fire. But anyway, long story is that uh, my grandparents are able to purchase a home about 10 minutes away from here. Um, and the city motto is called city with a mission without any sort of um, acknowledgement of the indigenous history and presence um, that is ongoing here. And so I work with Julia Bogany, who is um, an elder and a cultural ambassador for the tribe. And her great grandmother passed through this mission. Um, and my wanting to work with Julia, um, and this is a piece that we made together, but my wanting to work with Julia really sort of came about from wanting to understand histories of this land um, and wanting to 
revise my understanding of who was here, who is still here, who will be here. Um, and Julia was sort of the, the person that um, I was directed towards after attending um, a historical association meeting. Um, and from meeting her, you know, Julia is so generous with her time and with her resources and, and she is teaches incessantly and oftentimes for free. Um, she is the Pitzer College um, native elder in residence currently. Um, and Pitzer College is in Claremont, California. Um, and so I began this relationship with her that really evolved into this sort of grandmotherly grandchild um, type relationship in which we constantly sort of check in and ask each other different sort of questions about one another's lives, but also what began with like, you know, can you please tell me more about this history, this grave history, um, but it sort of evolved into something else. Um, and Julia has a question that she strives to answer, which is, I always say Tongva women never left their ancestral homeland. They just became invisible. How do we make ourselves now not invisible is the question I ask every day. Um, and so I think about this question as a, as a guide as well, um, and a responsibility, a social responsibility that I think artists working in LA, um, you know, should propose, or so should, should sort of answer in a, in a way or think about. Um, and I, and I think about this question a lot, um, which is, which is the sort of um, the result of that is this relationship that's developed with Julia and the art and all that stuff it, is what drives the relationship, but um, it's not the result of it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like the art, uh, the art things that we make together are sort of like, they unfold as the relationship unfolds. Um, and so this was done in 2018 um, with, uh, with Julia, um, or her, one of her names is Wise Woman, um, sitting underneath an oak tree and her grandmother's spirit sort of erupting from the oak tree. Um, and the paper here are all hand pulled paper out of local yucca leaves um, and oak leaves. Um, and so there's a lot of native plants going on here. Um, and some symbiosis going on with the butterfly and the oak tree. Um, and this is Julia's two great granddaughters. Um, and this is Julia's book, Tongva Women Inspiring the Future. Um, so this was done in 2018, uh, which then earlier this year or in the summer of this year, that work became a public uh, mural. Um, it's both public and also very specific. Uh, it's on the new student housing complex of California State University Dominguez Hills, which is in Carson Compton area. And this is sort of the first thing that one sees upon um, entering, entering the campus. So and through, through these slides, I'm trying to answer your question about how, how mentorship plays a role in my work. Um, and it's, it's hard to talk about because relationships are so organic um, and they're also hard to maintain and they also change. Um, so the work sort of functions as a document of that time, um, but, but yeah. Yeah, wow, thank you. I feel like, um, in thinking about tonight and what was, you know, thinking about your work. And I think, um, you know, often we start that when, when Plugin was still open, we started the exhibition tours, we would start with your piece. And it would always feel like, like such, like the, the best way to start the tour because of how 
um, layered the installation is, um, but also because it opens up all this possibility for thinking right away, thinking differently right away. But it's also so difficult to put language to it. So I think just following in what you, you had just mentioned, I think I've been thinking a lot about the different ways in which um, these type, these processes or, or these experiences um, really do have a time uh, of their own. And that that time is, is feels to me as it's not yet expressible in, in, in language or in words. So it's, it's often, I feel like I'm, I'm feeling it more than I am, no, more than I know what it is that I'm feeling, I guess, if that makes sense. <laughs> but it's a, anyway, it's just a comment. It's not even really a question. <laughs> no, I think what your comment is just so beautiful. And it, it um, I've been in my class that I teach at Otis, um, it's so much about embodiment and, mm -hmm. and sort of leading, leading with your senses and leading with things that, you know, have some sort of lingual delay or, or, or um, leading with in ways that, that, um, what's the word? Leading in ways that language can't quite capture mm -hmm. um, and, and, and going with that and figuring out what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you say that so that as some of the talks have been happening, there's things that are connections between the artworks and the exhibition that have been coming up to me up for me. So poetry um, being one of them, but language has played a large role in the exhibition as well. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I maybe didn't put it all together, but because so many uh, of the people, pro actually probably everyone in this exhibition is so disconnected from um, the language of their ancestors or are, are currently unable based on where they live to be able to um, consistently use that language. It's interesting to think about how language um, is something that is can really connect us even if we can't all understand each other. So there is this language that's emotional that we understand in each other's work um, that that speaks to something completely different than than the words that that we speak. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I also so this is a really small question that I have, but I um, I feel like uh, it's something that brings me a lot of joy every time I walk around your piece is the small embroidered rainbow on the back of the canvas. And I, I just was wondering if you could, not that you have to talk long about it, but you can if you have a lot to say about it, but to tell us a little bit about this, uh, this joyful um, surprise at the back of the piece. Yeah. Um... Well, uh, so the piece, the piece is um, depicting myself um, learning Atayal weaving. Atayal is um, an indigenous Taiwanese um, group of people. Um, and in a, few, uh, a year or two ago, I went back to Taiwan with my parents, which is where they're from. Um, it is where they're born, but not where they're ancestrally from. Um, so my grandparents were, um, one set of grandparents were sort of forced out of mainland China. Um, and the other set, there was more of a choice in large quotes involved. Um, um, although war doesn't really give, provide many choices. Um, but so my parents, um, my dad identifies as Han Chinese. So his connection to his Hmong heritage was already severed by my grandmother. Um, so he had assimilated into Han, Ch Han Taiwanese um, society as well as my mom. Um, and so the Chinese people that live in Taiwan, a lot of them 
uh, had been there gen for generations, and a lot of them came post-war. Um, and so they are a settler class, but they're, I, I hesitate to use the word colonial, um, just because I'm not sure if the, if the language is accurate, um, but they are a settler class. And so, um, you know, the indigenous people of Taiwan have suffered a similar fate to, to um, those uh, who live in the US. Um, and I thought about what kinship meant. Um, and so part of me, part of that for me is about craft because craft is um, technology that reverberates throughout time and space. I mean, you look at, you know, an indigenous Taiwanese footloom weaving, and then you look at the weaving in Guatemala, um, or you look at the weaving in Peru, so many connections. Um, not to say that they were all related at one point, or, you know, there's many ideas of why that would be, but, but through craft, you can really see how dependent on dependent people are on land and one another and how many sort of connections um, there truly are. Um, and so long story, the rainbow um, is a bridge, um, mythologically and cosmically speaking, um, for the for the Atayal ancestors um, and the living to connect. Um, and that bridge is made through the act of weaving. Um, and then at the same time, in that same, in where I first exhibited this work, um, my partner's best friend had passed away. Um, and I made a painting of him composting in the earth. We had, we had dug his grave. Um, and I made a, a little painting of that. And then before his funeral, I went up to see his husband just to spend some time with him. And then I saw two double rainbows going across the sky. Um, and so the rainbow essentially was this like connection to Jeff, but also doubly connection to Jeff who has now, who is now an ancestor, um, but also, you know, speaks to um, the sort of creation myth or origin myth of, um, not myth, story um, of, of the Atayal. Yeah, long, sorry. There's all, it's all these like threads. You have to get through it all. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. I love every second of it, Iris. Uh, <laughs> I think that was part of when you think writing the caption for your work was the hardest because I, we didn't want to take out details that we felt were also important. And then, yeah, it was just, uh, it was hard to summarize <laughs> writing that. Summarize. Yeah, I really appreciate it. No, but it's so rich that way and it's so full that way, which is what makes it so incredible. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if maybe that would be also a good, um, a good moment to talk to the audience more about um, what's exhibited at Plugin, but it, it's also so um, it's also so connected to other works that you have, as you just mentioned too. So I feel like I'm more interested also to think about the ways in which I feel like the structures played a very important role in 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 these installations that you have, which is you know that the framing is 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 quite similar. And, and that there are a few pieces that are presented in this particular way. And I just want wondering if you wanted to talk more about that, but also the color blue and how it really shows up in your work often. Yeah, are you talking about the literal frame? I'm talking about the, the Navajo frame, the, yeah. the loom frame, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I could talk about that. Um, let me just pull this up. Uh, so I also, so like, I would say my one true apprenticeship is with Melissa Cody. Um, my work with uh, Miss Cyrene Ural, who, who taught me, who's a master weaver, who taught me how to weave on the footloom. 
um, because so much time has passed and, you know, she's there and I'm here, um, there's not, or like we connect through line app. Um, our relationship is sort of um, both existent, but not really. Um, but with Melissa, I, I help her with stuff. Um, and I have a more tangible relationship to her. Um, and so Melissa Cody is a fourth generation uh, Navajo weaver and textile artist. And if you Google like contemporary Navajo weaving, like most of what you see is Melissa Cody's work. Actually here, um, here is uh, some of her work. Um, and so this is all woven. This is all woven on the, is a tapestry weaving. Um, and this is woven on the Navajo loom. And these are giant works. Um, but I learned how to weave from her. And this is her. Are you showing this stuff, Iris? Oh my gosh, yes I am. <laughs> we can't see it. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So embarrassing. But anyway, so if you see, these are Melissa's weavings. And these are giant weavings. Um, and this is all done on the Navajo loom or on a loom, um, upright loom. Um, and this is a tapestry loom and this is Melissa. And this was um, us doing a demonstration for the Downtown Women's Center uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and then I have a little video of Melissa sort of talking about her work, um, but I don't know if you want to get into that. But essentially, this is uh, how I work on my loom. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is what the work in the exhibition is, is alluding to. Um, so it's a collapse or it's bringing together these uh, seemingly disparate um, weaving practices. Um, and so the Navajo loom, which is not a functional loom, what's in the exhibition is not functional. Um, um, this is what it is. But there is a connection between these two weaving practices and it's through um, the C word colonization. And um, actually because when, uh, you know, Japan colonized Taiwan from 1895 to 1945 when they lost the war. Um, they essentially uh, coerced um, many indigenous people and the Han Chinese people that were already there um, to work in their uh, plantations um, to cultivate camphor. Um, and camphor uh, is a tree um, it can be produced to an oil. Um, it was used to produce uh, gunpowder. Um, and it was also used as an ingredient in um, celluloid, which is the world's first thermoplastic, um, which is what many of um, old Hollywood films are filmed on. Um, and so during this time, I was thinking like, wow, like our imagination of the great American West is like literally captured on celluloid on the in, on this material that is from East Asia um, and was cultivated largely um, through indigenous labor and and when they need indigenous labor they make um, indigenous people give up their entire livelihoods and weaving was a central component to Atayal life and so when you take that away you disrupt the entire society um, and so that, so, you know, bringing together these two weaving practices, um, in a way was a sort of artistic suturing, perhaps of, of time and space and scale, um, and cultures. Um, and I, I sort of wanted to get at that without being explicit about it. Um, because so much of what we understand of materials and processes and people and ways are are indirect and implicit. Um, and the color blue, 
I'm, yeah, the color blue is also like a bigger tenure or something research project or lifelong research project um, that begins with uh, learning how to dye with indigo. Um, and to be short about it, um, it's a way for me to tap into what was lost. Um, and indigo is something that needs oxygen to um, yield blue. Um, so I think about its connection to breath, to, to being alive, um, to death, to, to reproduction, to, rege uh, to regeneration. Um, and also because my father is Hmong and we don't know anything about that. And so the way to understand, to get close to what we don't know is through craft and is through dye practices and is through this color blue. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. Thank you for asking. <laughs> oh, I think we have a question from the audience maybe. Sure. Um, uh, oh, I guess they're still typing it because they just said the I question have a question. was not finished. Yeah. I have a question for you guys. Or you. Yeah. Um, how do you think friendship, um, how do you think looking to friendships can alter or, or bring about change? as to how one organizes the set of relationships that um, are needed for an institution such as yours to function. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, these things I'm thinking about, I'm just like, I yeah, love it. I'm just sitting in my room thinking about it. <laughs> I think I think about it every day, but I'm gonna let Jen take it first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so for me, I think what this, like working with Nazrin specifically taught me was, um, was new um, thoughts about trust. Um, and so, you know, in, uh, in other spaces I work in, it's not that I don't trust the people I work with, but there isn't sort of a because friendship isn't the foundation of why we're working together, we've never had discussions about trust or respect or um, our feelings about each other. And so I think that what happened for me during this ex exhibition that allowed me to also um, question, you know, the role that institutions played in the, the way that we were curating and what we needed to do to ensure that, um, our, what we were doing was um, protected or um, central, I guess, to everything um, that, that happened is, is acknowledging that no matter what, um, we were here for each other and the artists that were part of the exhibition. And that that caring, um, that caring uh, was, was the thing that mattered the most. So, um, you know, I, I, I always like, I know that deadlines are important, but deadlines weren't the most important thing or um, the needs of the institution weren't the most important thing. And what does it mean if it moves forward the um, vision of, of a, an exhibition based in care to, um, to relook at budgets and the needs of where money goes or things like that. And so, the, the institution it has to be there because it is, but what, like for me, the entire process was about how do we um, look at all of those um, institutional needs from the needs of our um, care for this exhibition and each other first. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, maybe that's a little formal, but that, that's for how, it, how it went for me. Right. No, it, it sounds like, your budget, you know, your protocol is like rooted in a set of really specific relationships and like honoring that specificity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, 
it was really uh, beautiful and it was also like like difficult and challenging. And I think because, you know, you realize when you push against the institution's demands, that those demands are just actually so non-urgent, you know, and so um, that, that, that things like deadlines or um, um, sending things out later than maybe we would have or um, centering each other's uh, well-being over getting things done, stuff like that. Um, when, you're when you're in practice of that, you realize to what extent, yeah, those things, those demands are just not that that important really at the end of the day because things will still get done and move in a certain direction and move in a way, but everyone will feel better anyway because of it. So I feel like, I'm not being very eloquent in terms of how I'm using my words right now, but I feel like these things were so important for me to notice and to feel and experience because it brought a different perspective to how I wanna move forward with any exhibition and any any person who I work with or any person who I even have a relationship with that um, really prioritizing care for each other and care for the artists that we're working in opened up this possibility of actually really doing things differently and not just talking about it. Mm -hmm. It was really in practice and it really felt concrete in that way. But there were hard moments like for me too, where I was challenged. You know, I have the tendency to be a, a workaholic in a certain way. So that then I would, I would in some ways take for granted um, that um, those, those habits were still in me. So it was also a good, it was a very, it was an eye opener for, for myself personally, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. There's so much to, to, to say about it. Yeah. And, I, and I think, again, it goes back to what you had said, Iris, about relationships. Like that when you're in relation, it's just so organic, it's hard to. And I felt that way with Jen a lot also, is that I, I really felt like very lucky to have found a, a like a, a partner in this and in, and in this way and that we could work off of each other. And it was, I mean, Jen and I are so different but I also feel like it was just so incredibly um, uh, complimentary and, and symbiotic in some ways. I don't, I don't know, Jen. <laughs> like we are so different. So I think it's just funny thinking about it because I learned, you know, so much about just like, you know, the value of also not, you know, um, what's the word? I don't know. I don't want to like, also like, yeah, the value of like taking time with <laughs> response. <laughs> yeah. In a way, I think COVID sort of allowed for that. I don't know if you felt that on your end, but it, it sort of illum like a, a illuminated how inconsequential some urgencies are. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it did the opposite as well. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think when you're thinking with an in an institution or an organization um, and with art um, um, yeah I, I don't know I found my conversations and correspondence shift during this time as well um, certain things got certain relationships became deeper and certain things that I thought were urgent or certain relationships that I thought were you know certain way didn't, didn't have to formulate that way yeah totally oh uh, we have a request from an audience member to maybe ha show more of your your work if you have images available yeah um i just figured out how to do my own website <laughs> i'm real excited about it um so here you can see more of my work um 
This is the mural commission at Dominguez Hills. Uh, Yeah, so this is uh, the entrance to the student housing complex. And this is um, a body of work made over five years. Uh, this is James Baldwin um, as a dragonfly um, dancing in the sky. And taken from a pretty famous picture of him dancing, I believe with um, Lorraine Hainsbury. Um, but there's some, uh, idea that the woman depicted as a core worker, but um, anyway, some, some ideas of who that woman is, but that's him. Um, and that's me and my partner. Um, this is a collaboration with uh, Paula Wilson, who's a frequent collaborator of mine. Uh, she's an artist based in Carrizozo, New Mexico. Um, and this was our mythical yucca. Uh, she has, she does a lot of work about the New Mexican yucca and it's a symbiotic moth pollinator. Um, and so the yucca and the moth, each yucca has its own moth that they co-evolved with one another in which they're the only ones that can reproduce with one another. Um, and so uh, the chaparral yucca is native to Southern California. Um, and we kind of combined uh, the two yuccas together. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is also at the front entrance, uh, but this is, uh, it was a private commission that then got blown up, um, but looking at different lace making techniques in Croatia. Uh, this was some old work that was then combined, Jimmy Durham, Kendrick Lamar, my friend that's passed, Emmy Kuriyama, um, and the Queen of Cups from the tarot deck, all sitting together in a blue vaginal birth canal, um, having some sort of conversation. Uh, and then this is, it's the same body of work, but a different iteration. Mm. And then um, this is some new work. It's uh, me as Mystique from X-Men, um, crying into the earth, trying to give it water, where Storm, Storm's eyes are erupting with dry lightning across the desert landscape. This is a COVID painting. <laughs> in which I was like, oh, so close, but so far, we can't touch. Um, yeah, but the leaves are cotton with leaves, which I've been sort of doing some research into that um, I don't know enough to share quite yet. Um, but essentially, the type of weaving Melissa Cody does is Germantown revival and Germantown weaving, uh, you know, was a type of weaving that uh, was started from tragedy um, during uh, the Navajo deport or the deportation of Navajo and Mescalaria Apache people to Bosque Redondo, New Mexico, um, called the Long Walk, uh, and it was the first time during this um, detention center called Fort Sumner, where. Uh, Navajo and Ap 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 Apache Mescalero people were given rations and part of the rations were um, woolens from Germantown, Pennsylvania in a place where they uh, manufactured uh, Civil War woolens. And so uh, the first aniline dyed yarns, four plied yarns were produced there and shipped via the railroad to this place in central New Mexico and from there, uh, um, many Navajo women would unravel these woolens and, and reweave um, blankets and clothing. And so during this time, the pattern, the iconic Navajo pattern of the eye dazzler sort of came about. Um, anyway, so I went there, I went to Bosque Redondo as a, it's a memorial site now. 
um, and they planted a lot of cottonwood trees. Um, and there were, there's a story about the cottonwood trees and the people that were interned there, but I'm not gonna share it because I don't remember exactly what happened. But that's kind of what, why the cottonwood appears in my work. Um, I think some people want to see the one at plug in. Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay, there we are. <laughs> realize, yeah. And anyone who's in Winnipeg right now, you could also see it from the windows. <laughs> so this is um, clay from Winnipeg. Uh, that I requested Theo um, to uh, harvest. Um, and the original installation was my friend's clay that I just, he had an installation right before mine and then I just, his clay dried up and then I just used his. Mm -hmm. um, but this was intentional that it be from Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very, very old earth clay, pre-treaty clay, like Theo told us to. Um, we do have another question from the audience. Um, I guess it's for uh, me and Jen too. Um, hi, I'm wondering if you can tell us how, when Iris's involvement in this exhibition began. <laughs> I mean, it the, I'm, I'm starting this, but it also seems like it began in similar ways to how Nazrin and I came to work together where relationships began far before the uh, ideas of these the exhibition ever came into play. So I'm saying that, but I'm going to leave it to Nazrin and <laughs> Iris to continue that part of the conversation because um, you were building a friendship and relationship long before this exhibition ever came to be. Yeah, well, that was a long time ago. Well, we met at uh, my partner's space, Visitor Welcome Center, and uh, Nazarin and I and, and Galare and Jimena, we went to Joshua Tree. <laughs> <laughs> we spent some time in Joshua Tree, that's right. <laughs> Galare is the um, solo exhibition. At yeah, Galare is in the exhibition next door. And it was a time in my life where I was spending a lot of time meeting a lot of incredible people, a lot of incredible artists in Los Angeles. And Iris was one of those people who I met along with Galare. Um, and then when Jen and I were talking about this exhibition, I think it was at a dinner with, at your house, Jen, a long time ago. Actually, that was when the pandemic, it was before the pandemic hit. I remember we talked about whether we should go buy extra toilet paper. I remember that. <laughs> that was like way in like February or like end of January or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we had, I had mentioned your work, Iris, uh, to Jen and we had pulled up images of it on, yeah, at the Visitor Welcome Center website and then um, and then Jen right away said, I know the perfect kind of um, other artist uh, where it could be a potential conversation. And it was with Megan's work. And, and, at that, and that's how also Megan O'Brien became part of the exhibition was we, through our conversation, we, uh, yeah, Jen saw a lot of similarity. Um, Jen was familiar with Megan's work. And then I got introduced to Megan's work through that conversation, yeah. And I think that this, like, this idea that, that Iris, you brought up too, and, and I think for me, it was, it was there right from the beginning is the idea, well, it's something that I've spent a lot of time researching is craft as technology and the way that craft is actually what has progressed technology throughout um, history. And so, you know, Megan, um, Megan's work is a video that is, you know, is very, um, is, is, has been made in, in a, 
animated way that um, used technology to create it and the idea of, of technology um, being the force of a way that we get to see this um, handwoven piece in a, in a completely um, newly formed way um, is something that I think like these connections of craft and technology um, really can, are there between both of your works, even even though that you know your work doesn't have like an active electronic work in it, that that idea is is so present just because of um, yeah, I mean what I've already said, but the the ways that um, craft and technology are always so connected, and so I think that it was so exciting to be able to bring together. Um, two works in the space, also myself having a huge leaning of, of researching craft um, to uh, have weaving be, you know, take up a lot of space in the gallery is really exciting for me. Yeah, and it was incredible to see both works the way they're positioned in the gallery, they're, they are really looking at each other. And then they're also both, I mean, in Megan's work, it's really more obvious in the sense that it begins with a constellation and then it forms outward and, and, and then you could see the entire blanket come together on the screen. But then, Iris, I feel like yours is also in some ways a constellation of having brought all of these different relations into it and that it's so emblematic of these relationships, as you said, that, that time is, is felt differently too when you look at that piece and if it's obviously not it's not an obvious constellation in the way we think of a constellation but but the composition is is there creating those links and connections yeah yeah um i think about like uh constellations when i think about my relationships to people mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a perfect word okay. we have a, a question from the audience. Um, Hi, Iris, can you talk about the terms and conditions you have on your website and your thoughts on creating thoughtful boundaries with institutions? Um, I have this, um, I have on my website a fact page. I totally toned down the language because when I wrote it, I was initially livid. Um, and then my friend was like, that's too harsh. Um, so I recently toned it down. Um, but essentially it's a fact page that, that um, kind of writes down questions as to like, um, I'm trying to pull it up. Um, yeah, you know, I think artists are often like in these really ambiguous spaces and, you know, are often uh, have like carrots dangled in front of them or, um, you know, even the idea of a studio visit with somebody, you know, can get misconstrued um, or the, the, the ask for a studio visit. Um, and so I, I put on my website, you know, ways that I would like to be approached um, in the spirit of just, you know, having friends that, um, um, lead by example that, that, you know, uh, outline their boundaries and outline their terms of working. So I, I felt that if I were clear, then there's no excuse for, you know, the other party to not be clear. Um, and really, you know, it, it's, a it's my own thing. It's like, I would like to exhibit your work. How do I go about this? I welcome it. But then there are different ways. Like if you're a museum, a commercial gallery, a nonprofit or a business, there are different ways of engaging. Or if you're an independent curator, or if you're just, you know, another, not just, sorry. Or if you're another, you know, artist run space, there are different ways to sort of uh, ways of working that I have, or like how do commissions work? Um, and I do think maybe I have like an idealistic idea of how Canada is, um, but I do think this is a pretty US centric um, page in that many US institutions refuse to pay their artists. Um, and I think that just um, further complicates, you know, artists are already precarious or living in precarity. And so, um, the art world in, in the US functions, thrives on that precarity. Um, 
And so this is just a way for me to like wanting to depend less on that world or that economic system. We have a, another question. This is amazing. We have so many great questions coming in this evening. Um, so Iris, in speaking about interconnectedness, multiple converging parts and the complexities of ideas and concepts in your projects, how do you approach editing a work or installation? How do you make decisions? And also working collaboratively, how do you, how are aesthetic choices made? Mm. Uh, learn by doing. Um, I started out mostly painting. So really just sort of two dimensional. And then whenever I would be asked to like hang a show, I would just not know how to do it um, because um, I didn't know how to think about or see things as, as space. I didn't know how to choreograph a space. Um, and so that, that is just the more exhibition experience, the better I know how to do it. And also I have a wonderful partner, um, with me who, who offers feedback and who, who's a great, um, has great ideas about how, how things are seen and how to sort of navigate space. And um, I'm lucky to, to have that. Um, and how do I make decisions and working collaboratively? Almost always I ask permission to, you know, see if this works or this doesn't work. Can I include, can I, you know, include your, you know, like, for instance, with Julia, it's a very different relationship than um, Melissa, right? And it's a very different relationship with Cyrene. Like Cyrene's like, oh, like no one, not no one, but like fewer people in the West even can conceive of indigenous Taiwanese weaving. So by all means, like I promote that um, or like show that. Whereas with Melissa, things are a bit more careful um, there's always permission asked, um, and Julia as well. I mean, in a city as big as Los Angeles, um, so few people know that there is an indigenous presence, multiple ind indigenous presences in Los Angeles. Um, and so Julia's work is really dedicated to amplifying that. And so, um, finding ways to uplift that, um, is a collaboration, um, and the aesthetic choices is mostly myself. Um, I, with Julia, that piece in particular, I was like, how do you want to see yourself represented? Like, where does your grandma come in? And she was like, oh, I want my grandma there or something. But that's kind of the extent. And so I'm like, oh, maybe a grandma can be a spirit through the tree. You know, I kind of, they have, I have an idea. I asked the question, but I sort of take it where I want or where we want it to go, but in my own way too. Yeah. I think that also leads maybe into the next question, which says, since you work with indigenous peoples and techniques, how do you navigate a respectful relationship that opposes appropriation as is evident in the work that you presented? Yeah. Um, my work is a deep study. Um, so, so, I mean, I struggle with like, how do I have even have distribute images of my work or how are images of my work distributed because they can be so easily misunderstood. So it comes with a lot of context. Um, and permission is a really big part of it. Um, and acknowledging that all exchanges are really unequal. Um, and that there will probably never be an equal exchange. Um, and so that's why I use the word permission rather than consent. Um, you know, I am working with, for, in the case of Julia, like I'm working with an elder. Um, first, she's an elderly lady. Um, and secondly, you know, um, she is a respected elder of her tribe. Um, and so, you know, I don't really do anything unless I ask her what she thinks. Um, and same with Melissa, she had to ask her elders uh, if, if she could teach me. 
um, she had to ask her elders if she could break out of the traditional styles of Navajo iconography. Um, and I think it's, a, it's about having a constant line of communication and, and asking what's okay, I think. Yeah, it's not really appropriation because I'm not taking symbols or like I'm not taking, it's not an aesthetic experience for me. It's like a, it's a deep committed study in ethics too. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's a hard one to, to navigate. And I think in the US too, it's, and this whole land is here because of ideas of ownership and theft. So it's hard to move away from the framework of appropriation, I think. But I, I think in places like Taiwan, that's not really the central conversation. Um, but in, yeah, just interesting ways to think about things moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're sort of also coming to the end of our time together. So I wanna sort of put that out there in case there's any um, more questions that sort of people wanna get in. I think we've gone through all the ones that have come in. Um, but Nazrin, I know I've asked a lot of questions. I don't know if you have anything else that you would like to ask about. Yeah, I don't, I think I'm, I guess I had a question. I think I want to know about your book. <laughs> My book. If you wanted to share. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if that book is ever happening. <laughs> COVID. Um, no, but I'm trying to, um, inspired by Ursula Le Guin. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, uh, it's sort of working on a fictional, imaginary, anthropological book. Um, so this anthropologist, I'm not sure if this is an artist anthropologist or an anthropologist, um, but they discover um, artifacts and a journal by um, a descendant of the blue people. Um, and this is a time, I haven't quite set the scene yet, but at this moment, I'm thinking this is a time when the U.S. has basically privatized all lands, um, and um, much many of the lands globally as well. And so the idea of the blue people is that they're no more blue people; they're only descendants of them. And the only way you know that you're a blue person is through the act of storytelling and through the act of making art. And so, inspired by things like X-Men um, around the teenage years, um, a blue, a descendant of a blue person would start to, you know, start making art or start like working on their thing or working on their language or working on their, their, their dance or their poetry or their craft or whatever. Um, and you can't identify them either from like race or skin color um, or gender, but it's, it's thought that they come from, um, all continents, um, but they don't have a homeland. Um, and so only in their art making do they find a home and only through their art making can they locate each other. Um, so that's kind of the, the narrative, but the book takes that narrative and is about, is a field journal left behind by this person called Blue Child. And this blue child is writing about um, the different relationships she's having um, with weaving, with Julia, with different people. It's kind of a, fr a magical framework for, for myself to write about my collaborations. Wow. Well, I can't it's wait. better than it sounds. Like hopefully like the excitement doesn't just end right there, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited for it. Just the idea of even being like, you don't, you know, this is what I struggle with often in terms of just like a, a diasporic positioning, you know, what does it mean to not be attached to this notion of a homeland or even experience that as someone who's never been 
to their own lens or and never had that kind of relationship or experience. So it's like, yeah, putting that into, into uh, this kind of conceptualization is, anyway, I'm excited for that, yeah. Thanks, Nasrin. Yeah, I mean, when I was given the opportunity to, to go see where my great grandparents were buried, whose graves were moved because there was a dam that was constructed nearby, it became apparent to me very quickly how sort of futile it was to do that. I mean, it was obviously meaningful, but it was like, wow. I thought I would feel something or find something to like find, like be in my roots. But in doing so, I realized like we come from so many different places and we're made up of so many different, like literally dust, the dust we carry, the like things that we carry from place to place, they're all embodied. Um, I think before we end too, I just want to acknowledge um, Jen. I just Jen has often said that you know the experience of putting on this exhibition is, really comes from an indigenous um, worldview and 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 an indigenous way of uh, thinking and and experience. And I just wanted to acknowledge that I feel very privileged and honored to have done that. Jen and learned that from you as well, Jen, that we were able to do this together in a way that it is very much based in the teachings that you have brought forward in this way and that you have recognized them to be that way. So oh, thank you so uh, much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Oh, it's an honor to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> um, and Iris, I just wanted to make sure that you, I know, the time seemed to go by so fast, but that you also got to share with us everything that you were hoping to share this evening before we sort of wrap up. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Nasrin and Jen, for inviting me to do this, um, and also to the questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. This is a truly wonderful evening. I feel so grateful for everything you said. I was trying to like not look down and write notes. So I have some really uh, hopes, that, notes I hope I can decipher later because there is a lot that you said that um, I really will be revisiting quite often um, as I think through this exhibit, but future exhibits as well. Um, so I really appreciate that. I appreciate that. That's so meaningful. I mean, it's a time where I feel like so many artists are actually like questioning what's the function of, of art and the function of being an artist. That's really meaningful to me. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to just maybe also talk quick or like to wrap this up just to mention that um, I'm just going to find my notes to make sure I'm saying exactly what I want to say. Um, that we um, do still have a program online right now. So we have a, a screening or an online uh, videos and film screening uh, curated by Mariana Munoz Gomez and Marianne Redhead. Um, and they brought this uh, program together in response to our exhibition. Um, and it's accessible for free on vukavu.com until November 18th. So just two more days to catch that. Um, our next event will be a poetry reading um, with Melanie Monceros on November 26th. And it's also really cool because Melanie will be giving an artist talk right after for another organization. So uh, we'll have this amazing evening of Mel, which I think will be such a, a wonderful experience for everyone to get to um, hear their poetry along with um, getting to learn about their practice. Um, and so for more information, you can go to Gallery 1CO3 or plug in ICA's website. Um, and I just want to um, thank everyone who attended tonight and thank Nazrin and Iris um, for everything that's uh, happened throughout uh, this exhibition. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you, Iris, uh, in the, the ways that we've been able to and to experience your work. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, well, I, I guess we're, we're ready to sign off. Um, it feels weird to do that, but um, thanks again, and we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye.
Bye. Thank Good you. night, everyone.